train de vraiment démarrer. Allez, bon courage, merci. Merci. Okay, great. Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, my name is Linga Muslimbay. I'm an economist, and uh, I currently work uh, at the Transition State Coordination Office at the African Development Bank. And I'm delighted to be the master of ceremony for this event. Um, distinguished guests and colleagues, ladies and gentlemen, the African Development Bank is pleased to welcome you all to this event for the presentation of the results of the report on trade finance demand and supply in Africa, evidence from Kenya and Tanzania. This report is a joint collaboration between the Microeconomic Institutional and Development Impact Division under the Macroeconomic Policy Forecasting and Research Department and the Trade Finance Division under the Financial Sector Development Department of the bank. Uh, the report has been produced in the context of the AFDB Trade Finance Research Project, which exists since 2014. And for the first time, the bank has conducted a deep dive analysis of the trade finance market in Kenya and Tanzania, using both data from commercial banks and firms across different sectors. During this event, the authors of the report and the expert panelists will discuss opportunities and challenges of the trade finance market in Africa. They will examine the demand and supply side factors driving trade finance gap and they will explain the impact of trade finance gap on firms in Africa. Ultimately, the goal is really, the goal of this conversation is really to provide strong evidence-based policy recommendations to both policymakers and buyer stakeholders. And as you can see in the agenda, we do have a rich program with a high level panel and top-notch expert on, on the topic. Without further ado, I will give the floor to Mr. Stéphane Neletambi, who is the Director of the Financial Sector Development Department of the African Development Bank, for his opening remarks. Mr. Neletambi, the floor is yours. Thank you, Madam Linger. <clears throat> Distinguished panelists, partners and friends of the bank, colleagues, ladies and gentlemen, allow me, on behalf of the bank, to warmly welcome you to the launch of the Trade Finance Demand and Supply Report. You may not believe this, but there's a limited understanding of the trade finance market in Africa, mainly due to the lack of data. Since 2014, though, we at the African Development Bank have played a leading role in studying the trade finance market to support trade finance policymaking in the region. While previous studies have focused on trade finance supply, numerous questions remain unanswered on the trade finance demand by firms based in the continent. Questions such as, what is the value of trade lost by firms due to lack of access to finance? What is the array of trade finance instruments available? What are the challenges firms face in managing trade finance and why some firms are discouraged from applying for trade finance instruments? This study attempts to fill these knowledge gaps as answering these questions has important implications for trade finance policymakers and practitioners. Although the study focuses on Kenya and Tanzania, its findings, while potentially different in degree, are likely to be similar in scope across the continent. Unlike previous studies, the study combines primary data from firms and banks to conduct a deep dive analysis of the trade finance market in Kenya and Tanzania. Using data from firms and banks allows for a more robust estimation of trade finance, rejection and unmet demand, and the challenges the firms face in managing trade finance applications across the continent. The firm level data also allow for a deeper understanding of how they finance their trade the types of trade finance instruments they prefer, and the implication of trade finance on export productivity, employment, and market access on the continent. We at the African Development Bank have long established the need for the continent to employ innovative and sustainable solutions. This is especially true in the trade finance space, 
where collective international efforts are needed to respond effectively and sustainably to the growing opportunities and emerging challenges faced by many SMEs on our continent. The bank therefore remains committed to playing a critical role both as an enabler and a partner to support financial players that promote greater trade among African countries. Our efforts in this regard have become even more relevant given the larger than expected negative impact of COVID-19 and the war in Ukraine on the continent's drive to industrialize and become more integrated. I'd like to commend the collaborative efforts between our research department and the financial sector development department that I lead, leading the way on understanding the trade finance market in Africa. With these few words, allow me to emphasize how thrilled we are to have you all join us for the launch of this trade finance demand and supply report focusing on Kenya and Tanzania. Let me also indicate how pleased we are to have such a well-rounded and experienced panel of discussants. I'm sure that the outcomes of today's discussion will help us in our efforts to increase trade finance support across the continent. We look forward to working with you all in the dissemination of this important report across the continent and beyond. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Stefan Alitombi, for these insightful remarks. Um, now I would like to give the floor to our colleagues, uh, Dr. Osman Gajigo and Dr. Eugène Bempom Nyantaki who co-authored the report and they will present the main findings. So maybe just before they start, a quick introduction. Uh, Dr. Osman Galigo is the manager of the Microeconomic Institutional and Development Impact Division in the Research Department of the Bank. Prior to this position, he worked at several institutions, including Columbia University and the World Bank. And Dr. Eugene Bempong Yangtaki is Chief Research Economist at the African Development Bank and before that, he was an assistant professor of global trade at the School of Global Studies and Partnership and a private sector development specialist at the World Bank. So, Usman and Eugène, you have the floor. Thank you. No, uh, thank you, Miss um, uh, Mbai. Um, good afternoon. Um, Ladies and gentlemen, uh, colleagues and distinguished uh, panelists, everyone. Uh, before the, uh, just a moment before the slide, just to uh, uh, add a few more words to uh, what uh, uh, Mr. Naltembe said. Um, you know, this is uh, the latest in a series of research we've done on trade finance. Um, beyond the knowledge generation aspect of this research, um, there are, you know, two main, um, you know, reasons and, and benefits from this study. Um, First, it is uh, to produce uh, knowledge that is relevant for operations. And that's always been uh, one of our guideposts in the research department. Um, this, this research and those before it, um, you know, looks into issues um, in, the, in the trade finance market that we previously know little about. And uh, therefore, this research can serve as inputs in the design of um, instruments and operations uh, to achieve development uh, targets. Secondly, this, uh, this research is very useful for, uh, for the research department because uh, we have a dual mandate, not only to produce research, but also to carry out ex ante assessment of, um, of uh, you know, non sovereign operations for their development impact and additionality. Um, these, um, as AFDB's operations are increasingly being dominated by uh, you know, financial intermediaries, it's becoming more important to understand the underlying markets. And this research helps us, you know, uh, carry out a more rigorous um, uh, assessment of projects. So, just wanted to give a, a bit of that background uh, before we uh, present the, uh, the actual results from this study. So, I'll just uh, pass now to my colleague uh, Eugene uh, Bempo, uh, who is the, uh, the 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 task team leader in the production of the uh, this research. Yeah. <clears throat> Uh, thank you, Osman, and uh, thank you, colleagues. I hope everyone can hear me. Uh, unfortunately, I have to turn off my videos so I can uh, <clears throat> get enough bandwidth for the presentation. Yeah, so as has been said, this is actually the fourth in the series of uh, trade finance reports that we've produced, uh, you know, working in partnership with our colleagues in the uh, financial sector department and the, and the research department. And the previous studies uh, have focused on, you know, trade finance from the supply side, and that means, you know, working with banks to get the data and analyzing them. 
Now, the unfortunate part is that, you know, uh, the story is, uh, is half told and we, we are missing information from the, you know, from the firms that actually uh, do engage in trade. And so for the first time, you know, we decided to actually shift our focus and look at trade finance from the perspective of firms. Of course, combining that with data from, you know, the banks that we've collected over almost, uh, you know, a decade now. Uh, so to do that, we decided to select Kenya and Tanzania because we know these are, you know, uh, countries with firms that are very active in in, uh, in the global market, you know, compared to the uh, average firm in the, in, you know, in Africa in general and, and East Africa in in, uh, in particular. So we surveyed about 800, 800 firms uh, for this work, and we combined that with data from about 50 eight banks, you know, between Kenya and Tanzania, and that accounts for 56% of all the, uh, all, all, all the banks in those two countries. <clears throat> Sorry, before I get into the trade finance aspect, just to give you a, a small, you know, idea of uh, the firm's participation in, 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 in international trade. And uh, what we observe is that firms in these two economies are actually very active in, in, in trade. You know, we find that when we ask the firms whether they, you know, they participate in global trade or not, we find that you know over seventy percent of them actually participate in in trade, which is, you know, a very significant share. Uh, then uh, we look into you know the, the the type of international activities they engage in, whether they only do export or you know a combination of export and import or only imports. And uh, not surprisingly, what we find is that you know most of the firms that engage in international trade, that is the 70 percent, about seventy percent of firms that engage in international trade actually are you know importers. And uh, you know this is not surprising because if you look at uh, these two countries, a huge share of their trade actually is on the on the import side, as you can see from the uh, from the graph on the right. Now we also try to look at the share of firms, you know, for those that engage in trade, the share that actually trade with other African countries. So, you know, in a, in a sense, try to see if you know firms are more uh, deepening in their regional integration or regional trade with you know firms in other countries uh, in other parts of the of the region. And what we find is that, uh, you know, for the for firms that export only a small fraction, you know, about a quarter of them in the case of Tanzania and in the case of Kenya, about you know 30% of them engage in trade with uh, you know within Africa. So you know this signals that a lot of the trade is actually uh, going outside the continent. And then we also look at their involvement in uh, global and regional value chains. And we you know for the first time we find some evidence to this, which is data that is uh, really missing. And then we, we get into the trade finance demand by firms. So what we actually ask you know, for firms, whether over the past three years, uh, they've had a need for trade finance or not. And about you know, two thirds of them actually indicated that, indicated that they needed trade finance to, <clears throat> to engage in international activities, which is not a very trivial fraction. You know, it shows the extent to which uh, not only exporters, but importers actually you know, require access to finance to engage in, in trade. But what is more interesting is that for the firms that is here, if we take the 66% of firms that indicated that they needed access to finance uh, to either export or import, only 83% of them indicated that, you know, they actually apply for trade finance. Uh, whereas about 17% of them indicated that even though they had a legitimate need for trade finance, you know, uh, they decided not to apply for one. And we asked them, you know, to essentially give us the key reasons why uh, they chose not to apply for trade finance, even when there was the need for it. And most of them cited the fear of default as one of the key reasons, as well as the history uh, history of rejection. You know, so these are firms we actually term the discouraged uh, applicants, who are very important, especially if you want to you know expand export volume or the number of firms that are engaged in trade activities. But because of the fear that they will be rejected, or you know, having had a history of default, they decide that even if it's needed, uh, they don't want to apply for trade finance. Uh, and then we want to dive deeper in, in, into these firms that you know chose to apply and those that chose not to apply, and see 
uh, on which spectrum they fall, they fall into. That is, you know, we divide them into SMEs, uh, medium-sized firms, and large enterprises to try to get a sense of the firm that are actually uh, you know, staying out of the trade finance market or self-rationing themselves and not participating in, in trade finance. And what we observe here is that most of them are actually medium-sized and small firms. In fact, only 4% of large firms indicated that they had a need for trade finance but chose not to apply for one. Whereas in the case of medium-sized firms, that is those with, you know, employees between 10 and 49, 21% of them indicated that they, there was a need for trade finance, but they chose not to apply for one. And for small firms, uh, 13%. So this go, goes to show that you know, a lot of the uh, discouraged applicants in the trade finance market are actually uh, small firms, which sort of agrees with what we know from the bank side uh, from previous studies. Another dimension is also to try to understand uh, the trade finance instruments that are used by firms in these two economies. Uh, historically, there's been studies showing, you know, arguing that, uh, of course, without you know a lot a lot of uh, data to back it, that you know letters of credit are actually the most common instrument that are used. But when we ask the firms, it seems most of them uh, rely on unfunded trade finance instruments, mainly short-term revolving you know, credits, pre-export finance, in the case of import pre-import finance, and uh, unfunded trade finance instruments that are actually you know. Uh, uh, less risky are, are used uh, the least, you know, that is letters of credit and, and credit insurance. And, uh, you know, we know from other studies uh, in places like the US that, you know, uh, the, the pattern we observe in actual Africa actually follows what exists in under, other markets. There are studies in the US that show that most firms actually rely on uh, you know, funded instruments rather than on funded instruments. And here we speculate probably, you know, this could be a case of limited understanding on the side of firms, especially the SMEs, in terms of the instruments and options available to them, or the fact that they probably, you know, uh, are not able to go through the scrutiny that are needed to, uh, you know, get access to unfunded instruments. And then we, we, you know, we also look into getting access to the sense of uh, getting a sense of the average value of trade uh, approved uh, for firms. And here I want to note that you know the, uh, what you see on the bars, the two hundred and eighty-seven thousand in the case of Kenya, these are values for three years. So you know, for a typical firm, the average value of trade transaction approved for a three-year period is about you know almost close to uh, three hundred thousand. So if we strike the average for that period, so the trade finance value on average for Kenya is about 96,000, uh, whereas that for Tanzania is about 93,000. And then we also ask, we've known uh, historically from, uh, from the data we've collected from the banks that the rejection rate is quite high, about 40%. And this number we have from our studies also, you know, converge with that reported by other organizations like the ICC. Uh, trade finance surveys, uh, but you know, the, uh, when we did this, the study on the bank side, we actually also looked at the distribution at the at the regional level, and that gave us a sense of uh, you know significant differences within the sub regions. So we decided to look you know uh, at the rejection approval rate at the country level, and what we find that you know there is actually uh, quite you know rejection rate is actually quite high. In the case of Kenya, you know, twenty percent, as reported by the firms, whereas that reported by the banks is about is about eight uh, percent. In the case of Tanzania, the numbers roughly tend to agree, you know. And we think having the you know having the data from the from the firms actually you know uh, uh, gives us a deeper look into you know what the true uh, picture of rejection looks like because. Uh, Sometimes the firms apply for access to finance, as we will see in, in, you know, in, in later slides, but the banks don't even know that the firms are using that for trade finance. So the firms are actually in a better position to give us what the true rejection rate is than uh, what the banks uh, provide. Uh, of course, you know, we, one of the key things we also look into is the uh, reasons for rejection, and uh, we try to compare the the reasons from the firms to you know that reported by the banks in the in the previous studies, and the firms actually indicate that you know uh, insufficient collateral and constraints on bank capital are the key reasons why uh, the banks reject the application. And when you compare this to you know the the uh, you know the data from the banks, 
as we see on the right, the, the banks also indicate insufficient collateral and, and client credit worthiness, essentially the same thing as the reasons why they reject the applications from, uh, uh, from the firms. So it seems these two you know, as, uh, inadequate collateral and client credit worthiness are actually very significant structural constraints on the trade finance market in the, in the region. Uh, and then given that you know, collateral is a big uh, aspect of you know, the reasons for rejection, we try to look into how this differ across firm size. And what we see is that you know, most of the firms that actually indicated that they, they needed collateral to get trade finance were actually small firms. You know, uh, the, they form 37% of all the firms that had to provide collateral and medium firms actually accounted for half of all the firms that needed collateral to get access to trade finance. And if you look at the graph on the, on the left, what you see in Tanzania, that collateral requirement is actually very high, almost 71% of firms required collateral before they could apply for, uh, before they could obtain access to trade finance from, from the banks. Now, one of the things we were interested in, you know, what are the alternatives to firms uh, in the event that the applications get rejected? <clears throat> and one of the surprising results was that, you know, 14% of them indicated that they had no alternative when the applications are rejected. So essentially, uh, these are firms that are forced to cancel trade transactions because they couldn't get access to finance uh, from the firms. Most other, other firms also indicated that you know, they use alternative means. In some cases, they apply for credit from uh, you know, trade financing from banks, but they, uh, you know, they masquerade them as other forms of finance other than uh, financing for trade in order to get uh, access to that finance. And some of them are forced about you know, a third of the firms are forced to pay upfront uh, to engage in trade. And 6% indicated that they use informal channels. And then we also asked firms about the key challenges in managing trade financing in general, that is you know, uh, either on, the, on their side or in dealing with the, uh, with the firms. And the key challenge, the key ones they indicated were high interest charges, you know, uh, delays and bureaucracy. And this is something you actually don't observe uh, uh, from the bank level survey. It appears, especially firms that deal in time sensitive, uh, we don't present that results here, but if you break the data down, firms that deal in very time sensitive products, especially like flower exporters in Kenya indicated that you know, uh, delays are uh, one of the biggest constraints for them in obtaining access to trade finance. And of course, you know, inadequate collateral also shows up uh, significantly. And then we look into the impact of you know, access to trade finance of, on uh, our trade participation. So here, the firm's ability to export or not, and uh, whether they have access to trade finance. And in Kenya, about 25% of exporters indicated that you know, they had to abandon some, uh, some sale, export sales because they couldn't obtain access to trade finance. And you know, for importers, 16% of them <clears throat> Had to abandon import purchases because they couldn't obtain access to trade finance. <clears throat> For Tanzania, 20% of firms uh, couldn't export because of lack of access to trade finance, and 12% uh, uh, of importers couldn't import because of lack of access to trade finance. Now we ask firms <clears throat> to give a sense of the as a sense of the value of trade that they had to forego because of lack of access to trade finance. And here again, you know, the numbers on the graph are uh, the information for the three year period. So if you break that down uh, in Kenya, you know, the average value of trade lost due to uh, lack of access to finance is about 80,000 USD per firm. And uh, in the case of Tanzania, it's about 25,000 USD per firm. That firm, they had to forgo because they couldn't uh, get access to finance. Uh, one of the key things is to estimate a trade finance gap at the country level. We've been doing this at a regional level for uh, the previous studies. But again, you know, it's important to know this information at the country level for, for you know, policy purposes. And getting the information from the perspective of the firms is important for a couple of reasons. One is that you know, when you estimate a trade finance gap 
only using data from the banks. What you actually take out is, you know, you ignore what we call the latent de demand. That is the firms that actually are discouraged from applying in the first place. So there is a need, uh, but they, you know, they don't even go to the banks to request the, uh, that financing. So if you estimate the gap from the perspective of the banks, you actually don't capture this data. And what this could lead to is, you know, uh, you bias the data, the, the gap downwards, you underestimate uh, the trade finance gap because you are ignoring the 16, 17% of firms that actually had legitimate reasons to apply to get trade finance, but, you know, couldn't because there was a fear that they will be rejected. And then there is also the potential to overestimate uh, the trade finance gap if you only look at data from the banks and <clears throat> the reason is that when we look in into our data the typical firm works with about two to three banks so when the application is rejected by one bank you know the probability that they go to another bank to request financing is not zero so if you get the data only from the perspective of the banks what you will be doing is that you know you are overestimating the rejection rate which is important for estimating estimating the gap so, you know, trying to get the, uh, 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 the gap estimate also from the perspective of the firms is, is very important to compare if what we know from the banks, you know, uh, actually compares favorably to what we know from the, uh, uh, from the firms. And also there is the issue of the non-bank intermediated, you know, trade finance that, you know, uh, we could be also ignoring. So we first do the trade finance estimate, a gap estimate for the case of Kenya. And on the left, you see the, uh, you see the gap when we use data from the, uh, from the banks. You know, that is the data we've been collecting from the banks. So we, we, do the, we use the rejection rate as reported by the banks and the number of banks that are active in the trade finance market. And we come up with a gap of 3.2 billion uh, you know, on med demand for, uh, you know, reported by banks in Kenya. And then we also look, uh, use the rejection rate as reported by the firms, and we extrapolate that for you know, the share of firms that engage in uh, global trading in Kenya. And then we come up with a gap of about 2.91. I remember one of the previous graphs indicated that when the applications are rejected, some of the firms find other means of you know, informal payments or upfront costs. So this gap of about 300 million uh, you know, that is shown in the, in, the, you know, in the dark blue could actually be just a margin of error for the share of the trade finance gap that firms try to fill uh, through alternative means. But when we do the calculation, what we see that even if this is uh, the share of the financing that they are trying to you know, cover from other sources, it's only able to meet 9% of, of the total on met, on met demand. So this shows that when banks reject the trade finance application, the firms actually really, really have very you know, uh, limited capacity to get funding elsewhere to support their trade. We do the same for Tanzania, you know, estimate the data from the supply side, uh, the gap from the supply side. And then on the right, we also estimate it on the demand side. And so the information from the banks uh, uh, indicate that uh, the trade finance gap in Tanzania is 1.3 billion. And uh, that, you know, on the firms indicate is also 1.3 billion. So very close uh, gap. Now, just to put that in perspective, you know, so what this is telling us uh, is that if you take the trade finance gap in the case of uh, in the case of Tanzania, you know, that is that represents about nine percent of the country's total trade, which is a you know, which is not a trivial share. So, you know, due to lack of access to finance, if to put it in, a, in, <clears throat> in other words is, you know, Tanzania can increase its, its trade by 9% if, you know, you know, not because of lack of, if the, if the issue of lack of access to finance is, uh, is resolved. And in the case of Tanzania, in the case of Kenya, you know, uh, the trade, uh, you know, on, on med demand actually represents 14% of uh, Kenya's total trade. And if you compare that to you know, the total trade finance gap we know in Africa to be about 91 billion uh, as of 2019, the gap in uh, Kenya represents 4% of the total gap in Africa. And in the case of Tanzania, it's about 2% of the total gap. Now for the firm that had access to finance, we look at the impact of uh, you know, getting access to trade finance on their export performance. <clears throat> 
employment and other variables, but we just show two of them here. And we clearly see a positive relationship between access to trade finance and export productivity. So here, export productivity is measured at, as export sales per, you know, per number of workers. And we see that firms that have access, you know, the higher your access to trade finance, uh, you know, the more productive you are in terms of export. And you also see a clear positive relationship uh, between access to trade finance and employment. So firms that are able to obtain access to trade finance uh, tend to export, export more. Here we, we distinguish the impact of access to finance on you know, uh, uh, women-owned businesses and men-owned businesses. And what we see is that uh, women-owned businesses actually tend to you know, exp export to more markets when they have access to finance than enterprises that are wholly owned by men. So just a quick view of some of the you know, policy recommendation. And you know, one of the key things is, is the issue of credit worthiness and in the, ca and the case of insufficient collateral. We believe this is an issue that actually has to be solved uh, because you know, we've observed this throughout the years for almost 10 years now, the firms keep mentioning you know, lack, lack of uh, collateral and credit worthiness as, uh, and, and weak credit worthiness as the key constraint to the trade finance market. So this is something that policymakers really need to pay attention to. And it could be in the form of you know, helping firms, especially SMEs to develop the capacity to better manage their risk and capital so they stay credit worthy. You know, banks could also be supported in, in terms of you know, finding uh, more efficient ways to assess the uh, you know, SMEs, SMEs access to trade finance needs. There is also the need to introduce instruments, you know, such as single transactions and portfolio guarantees. Here, really working with local banks, most of the instruments DFIs have target uh, global banks uh, in the form of uh, risk participation agreements. But we think there is a need to work with local banks on the continent uh, to help them really support the firms, especially those that are discouraged. Uh, from applying for trade finance, because if we are really going to increase the number of firms that actually participate in, in trade, you know, we need to solve this issue. There is also the need to explore other alternative forms of non-bank uh, trade finance instruments that are picking up in other regions of the world, but are not uh, very used in, in the continent. There's also the issue of digitization. Uh, to reduce delays, especially for firms in uh, time-sensitive sectors. And so here, the good news is that progress has been made, uh, you know, thanks to COVID. A lot of the banks have instituted uh, measures to expedite trade finance processing, and we think there is a need to build on that momentum. Uh, the support for women-owned businesses, I think, should also be sustained. Uh, DFIs are doing a lot in this space, and uh, we think, you know, more should be done especially given that we see these firms actually being, you know, uh, the significance of uh, women-owned firms participating in, in, in trade is, is actually high. And then, you know, we think there is also the need to participate, uh, you know, to expand these studies uh, to cover a lot more countries because, you know, we see a lot of variations. Uh, even in the case of Kenya and Tanzania, you know, in the same report, you see a lot of variations in terms of the gap and then in terms of rejection rate. So you know, there is a need to support uh, studies like this and not only within the DFI community, but also you know, move it to the scholarly community or for governments, you know, local research organizations to be able to estimate the gap and un understand uh, the issues that enterprises and banks face within the local market. Uh, thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Usman and Jen, for this uh, presentation and uh, this, um, this insightful uh, um, results. Uh, I will not try to summarize it all because there is a lot of information there. But what I find particularly interesting is, for example, the re result about gender, that when women access actually to trade finance, they tend to perform better than, than men. I find this particularly interesting. And also the fact that despite a significant share of, uh, of firms participating in global trade and the fact that you have, you know, high demand for trade finance, you still have a, a, couple, I mean, a group of firms that still do not apply because of a fear of rejection. So I think the discussion during the panel um, 
the next discussion uh, uh, with the, with the expert uh, uh, will maybe shed light on this and you know how we can make sure that these firm they apply for trade finance, but they can also get the collateral that they need to be able to to access uh, uh, financing. Uh, so it is now time for us to introduce the second part of this event, uh, which is the panel discussion. And this is going to be moderated by Dr. Marc Aubois. Uh, Marc is a counselor in the Economic Research and Statistics Division of the World Trade Organization. And previously, he's held several positions at the IMF. He was Deputy Secretary General of the Monetary Committee of the European Union, and he worked for the French Treasury. Uh, so Marc, Mark, sorry, I'll give you the floor for the panel discussion. Thank you very much. Thank you so much. Um, and I will just uh, take it over from here with my excellent panel. Let me just introduce them, uh, starting with uh, ladies, of course. Uh, we have Makiko Toyoda from the International Finance uh, Corporation, who, uh, which is the... Um, private sector arm of the World Bank Group, uh, which is also involved in the provision um, of uh, trade finance uh, facilitation. Um, and uh, Makiko has been uh, working closely with us uh, here at the WTO for many years. Um, I do not need to uh, overpresent her. Uh, she's been with the IFC for almost 20 years. Um, we have as well um, Lamine Drame, who's the head of the trade finance uh, division and uh, precursor of the trade uh, finance program at the uh, African Development Bank. Uh, and Lamine is also, uh, I wouldn't say old friend, but we've been working together in uh, the uh, during the global financial crisis and the in the aftermath when the. Uh, AFDB program was set up. Um, we do have two uh, executives from uh, the uh, private sector, from uh, the financial sector. We have Mr. Uh, Beranu uh, Endosho. I hope I'm pronouncing uh, his name right. He's an executive for Global Client Solution and co-financing at the Trade and Development Bank. And we have Mr. Suresh Chetu, the sector head at for banks and DFIs at the first RAN Bank. But before I address my panel and I strike a few questions to them, I just would like to make just a few opening remarks uh, or introductory remarks based on what we just heard. Um, we just saw in the last slides that trade finance was so crucial for export performance or for just trade, for doing trade. Without trade finance, you can't trade. And therefore, it's so crucial for trade integration. We know in the world that there are significant trade finance gap. We know from the global side, from the global trade finance gap study of the Asian Development Bank, to which all the MDBs are participating as well, that the global trade finance gap is around $1.7 trillion, uh, mostly in developing countries, and the highest in value in the largest of the developing countries' traders. But from the excellent African Development Bank's surveys, we know that the trade finance gap as a share of the market are the highest in Africa. For example, the market was estimated in 2019 to be around 420 billion in Africa, uh, the total size of the market, and the estimate of the gap is around 80 billion, which means a 20% gap. Now, still with this, and with some of the few reasons for the gaps, we did not know much about um, the gaps in the field. And I would like to say bravo to the African Development Bank team because they've done an excellent job at this deep dive. And what do we learn? Two things I would like to highlight, um, and I will not redo the presentation, but one thing that is very important for economists is uh, we understand better the rejections and the mechanics between the rejection on trade finance requests. But even more importantly, even for those who get accepted, they tend to pay very high rates. 
very high fees and interest rates. For example, the study provides for estimates of the cost of finance as a share of the transaction values for trade uh, and by instrument used, for example, 13% on average of the transaction uh, value for short-term revolving loans. So that helps us compare trade finance cost relative to other trade costs and help us understand how constraining this is for traders. Now, with this being said, let me just structure the discussion around three big questions. We taking, by the way, as a basis, the conclusion part of the report, which I picked a few sentences from, for example, banks need to be incentivized to reduce rejection rates and provide more trade finance to their clients, notably by the use of trade finance facilitation programs, or they must be incentivized to use alternative trade finance instruments uh, to be that their instruments like factoring or supply chain finance need to be promoted, or digitization, as we heard, would be uh, very helpful to reduce the cost of processing trade finance and make trade finance uh, supply responsiveness to be stronger. And with this, I would like to ask a question on the supply side, questions on the demand side, and maybe question that could be addressed by the policymakers. And on the supply side, let me start with this to my panel. Uh, what do you think actions and what actions uh, can banks and other financial intermediaries um, could take to improve trade finance availability for clients in Africa. Uh, for example, in, as we heard, in terms of reducing the collateral requirements on something that is already well collateralized. Let's not forget trade finance has a very low default profile, one of the lowest of all financial instruments, and it is collateralized by the merchandise itself, what's, that's the genesis of a letter of credit, for example, your collateral is the merchandise. Um, and um, so what, um, you know, what it needs uh, uh, for introducing supply chain finance or digital finance. So let me just strike these first questions to my panel, maybe starting with Makiko, let's giving uh, let's give it a little premium to our ladies today and uh, and then please carry on um, the discussion among amongst you before I turn to the demand side. Um, sure, Mark. Um, thank you so much for um, framing these issues, and um, um, uh, thank you, Lamy, for inviting me to this uh, today's uh, discussion. Before um, answering uh, Mark your question about the supply side, um, let me congratulate African Development Bank uh, colleagues uh, for this uh, groundbreaking study uh, launch uh, report launch. Um, I too agree with uh, Mark that, that this is really an impressive study that uh, that has been done by African Development Bank. Uh, in these, these, these two countries. And then um, we all know that the uh, African Development Bank has been the frontier of a trade finance gap study in Africa since 2011. Um, we all know that Usman, Eugene, and Lamin uh, celebrity of a trade finance gap study. But then what is mind blowing for this study uh, is really because of this uh, trade finance costs that uh, Mark, you mentioned. I think this is uh, um, more like maybe the first time that we all see in this type of study. This is really impressive that you have a price information. And I think IFC, we are trying to conduct a trade finance gap study um, global wide. And then we are doing a little bit of study in countries like Brazil and Honduras, Vietnam and other countries. Um, but then that was a good uh, um, information for us to think ahead that what kind of information we'd like to include in this type of study. So again, uh, thank you uh, for um, this uh, uh, pretty impressive uh, report. And then we will uh, think ahead uh, what kind of uh, uh, improvement that we can all make in this uh, type of uh, survey. So thank you. Uh, going to the supply side uh, discussion. So um, I agree with Mark what you said about uh, collateral, for example. Um, 
yes, this um, SMEs issue, um, not having access to trade finance is not just Africa issues, actually, this is global issues that you see everywhere in this emerging markets. And then I totally agree that, um, for example, inventory financing is really the hot topic at this moment, that uh, this is, I think, spotlighted at this moment is simply because now people are not doing a just in time, but then we are thinking about just in case type of approach that we have a huge inventory. So I think if you have a good in inventory and if it is a collateral, then maybe there's not so much needs to have a collateral. Um, and then this is a kind of a different mindset that we all have to have as a bankers. And then if, uh, if the country hosts a good credit bureau or maybe secure transaction law, um, maybe SME has a better chance to get a um, chance to apply for this trade finance uh, uh, options. So in this case, this is area that we all can improve together. Um, the other aspect that I'd like to add here is uh, maybe to think about a different product. So not uh, maybe a traditional type of uh, uh, lines, but then, for example, supply chain finance is uh, mentioned in this report. And uh, I totally agree that uh, we all have payables and receivables. So why don't we use payables and receivables? And this is uh, actually a perfect product that we can switch the credit risk from the SMEs to the larger corporates and then I think um, this is a way for us to be able to advance cash to the suppliers or maybe SME sellers uh, by using this technique of supply chain finance. I think now supply chain finance is really highlighted in this market and IFC too, we are trying to consider a um, uh, new program uh, related to supply chain finance. But then I think this is an um, area that, uh, that we would like to disseminate this uh, uh, knowledge to the banking industry. Uh, as IFC, we also would like to help banks to implement this type of uh, product. Um, and we are active in the capacity building activities. So this is an area that, uh, that we can uh, consider to ramp up. Um, the last comment uh, about the digital trade. Um, Mark, you mentioned about uh, the benefit of digitalization. I totally agree with you that, for example, digitalization can contribute to for maybe easy onboarding of SMEs. And then I think this is area that we can maybe focus on in the coming uh, few years. Um, I think IFC is also trying to contribute to the capacity building activities uh, for digital trade. Uh, we also did a pilot digital trade transactions uh, last year. So we are still doing a baby step, but then I think as an industry, this is uh, something that uh, we should promote um, so that uh, we can contribute to close the trade finance gap. Uh, thank you. Thank you uh, very much. Um, I would like to uh, maybe uh, uh, directly uh, ask uh, one of the bankers to react to uh, um, what, what would be uh, the constraints to um, promoting the new products, if there are any constraints, or um, is this on the way? Um, there seems sometimes to be a disconnect between um, the supply side studies from the bank where you see a prevalence uh, of LC business, of letters of credit business. And from the demand side, we, we've seen that there's a lot of, uh, um, you know, short-term revolving loan, import loans, pre-shipment loans. So what's your take on this? Um, please go ahead. Mark, maybe I could, I could maybe uh, uh, kick off this since I, 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 you know, I do represent the private sector. Um, firstly, you know, thank you very much, Lamine, for inviting me. I, 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 you know, I find this very, very insightful. Um, firstly, to, to have read the extent of the study and, and, and I've had the privilege of working with Lamine and the team in the African Development Bank for a number of years now. Um, so a couple of things, you know, Mark, that, 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 that surprised me, but, but let me just step back. Um, first thing I think we need to just do is maybe just some terms of reference, maybe just be more clear on what trade finance actually means and what that means in the world of an SME or a client, because it, it, it can be quite broad. Now, we can speak about trade finance. Uh, I'm talking from a banker's perspective or private sector bank perspective around the importation of goods. But I think, remember, there is a lot of pre-shipment and post-shipment financing that's also involved in the entire value chain. So whilst I do agree with you that that the, that the goods in itself is collateral. Remember, you'd usually find that that goods arrive and they will have to be unsold 
there's usually a term or a tenor basis, deferred tenor, and then there's a repayment cycle in terms of the working capital cycle that actually repays. So there are two really key elements here that I want to want to maybe cover. And I think it's worth fleshing out a little bit further. And that is how do you, I agree with you, we, we can look at ways to mitigate credit risk, and that's the one answer. The second is how do we automate and digitize much with much more velocity? How do we digitize around the documentary credit risk? Because remember, documentary credit risk is introduced in cross-border trade. And this is something that is, I believe, least understood by a large proportion of our SME clients. The last proportion and dynamic that's introduced here is exchange rate risk. Because when you're looking at cross-border trade, there's naturally uh, local currency versus the foreign currency in which the imports are starting to happen. And as a result, exchange rates risk, particularly with volatility in countries or, or in currencies in Africa, does pose a significant credit risk in terms of the profitability of those transactions during the lifetime of their transaction for a SME. So some of those dynamics do come to play when we're looking at the credit worthiness of a transaction. Let me make it very, very clear. And, and, and I, I think I speak for, for, for a large proportion of private sector banks. No one wants to turn business away. So you know, it is not that there's a deliberate attempt to, to stymie or stop business in fact, we want to grow SMB business for a number of reasons. One, because it contributes significantly to entrepreneurship, not only in South Africa, but across Africa and across the world. The better we can grow SMEs, the more we can focus on them, the better it is for all of us as, as bankers and for our economies, both in South Africa and the world. The second thing is we want to acquire customers. We want to acquire profitable customers and we want to attract new business. So this is really, really exciting. I think the, the last point I want to try to make is also that it'll be really, really exciting for me if AFDB could follow up just on that percentage of clients that did avail of themselves of trade finance, whether they were importing or whether they were exporting. And I'm really, really keen to hear what their client experience was. I'll be more than happy for, for us to also, you know, uh, be represented and, and provide you with some data on what the experiences are, because that will really help us shape what we need to do better in the future for those SMEs that chose not to avail themselves of, of trade finance. Uh, the last thing I wanted to just talk about was this 40% rejection rate. Uh, I, I'm not too sure whether, and I think we must, be, we must flesh this out, was this rejection rate as a result of they went to the bank and they declined? Or was it because of education? For me, I would think that education, not knowing what an LC is, not knowing what the ability, that you have the ability to negotiate documents, not having the ability to understand what is a deferred payment LC versus site, what is an SBLC, you know, are there any other alternatives? Are LCs more expensive? And, 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 and my learned colleague from the IFC just mentioned it, and, and, and I agree with you, we need to digitize a process where we, for example, why can't we just all agree to guarantee a bill of exchange to a supplier? We stand behind it and let the documentation process then follow. It's, I think there is a dire need, and I'm very, very keen to work with the teams on this for us to see how we can digitize and fast track trade finance for SMEs using alternatives apart from what I think might be uh, quite a, a slow process using letters of credit, for example. I'll stop there. Um, and, and maybe we can discuss this further. But really, really exciting. And again, well done to the AFDB team on this report. Thank you, Suresh. Um, I, I, um, I would like to have the perspective as well of um, uh, Isayas um, in order to have a sort of consistent view. And, and I'll pass the floor to, uh, to Lamin after that, so particularly as one question was, was thrown to him. Um, what's your point of view, Isayas? I think you you may be muted or we're not hearing you uh, yet. 
I'm, I'm afraid we are, we are not. So maybe let me, uh, before you settle that issue, let me um, uh, move to uh, to Lamin and then we'll we'll have you back immediately after. Lamin, um, you heard um, uh, Suresh. Um, I think what I got from Suresh, I mean, um, is um, is two things. One is that uh, maybe collateral requirement would be less if documents were arriving quicker and would be processed faster. Um, and, uh, and of course, you know, there would be other issues like exchange rate volatility and risk and real risk issues to, to manage. But I think there's, uh, there's something that, uh, that has to do with this. And the second thing is that lack of education or lack of um, uh, financial literacy about what to ask in terms of the uh, um, of the um, of the products of the instrument, um, how to educate SMEs to uh, to ask for the right instruments. Uh, that may be uh, one question. Although I see that, sorry, Asayas, would you like to try? Can you hear me now? Ah, yes, we hear you now. Okay, okay, thank you, uh, thank you. Good afternoon, everyone. Um, thank you, Lamin and the FTP team for inviting me for this uh, very interesting panel. Uh, discussion and uh, uh, for the very insightful study, uh, especially for me during uh, every year, uh, more than two billion US dollar uh, trade finance transaction in, uh, in the Eastern and Southern African countries. I think my previous speaker uh, somehow touched uh, some some important points, uh, but uh, mostly I think the challenges that face uh, uh, demand and supply side. Uh, factors in, in African uh, uh, trade. I think uh, uh, the facilitation of uh, the facilitating of international trade among farmers, particularly SMEs, uh, is an objective for African economies. Um, firms that uh, participate in export markets, for instance, uh, are larger, more productive, and pay higher wage than those uh, that, those that uh, do not export. So um, I think this is also somehow in, 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 in the study, uh, somehow uh, touching the, some points, but really very, very important points. Um, I mean, uh, about one or one in four exporters in failed to meet some export sales due to a lack of access to trade finance each year. Um, this is what, what we are most of the time also facing, uh, but, but uh, also from, uh, from the uh, uh, importer side is mainly more, uh, a significant number of firms which, which a legitimate need for trade finance fail to apply for trade finance facilities, especially in the SME area, uh, or most uh, South Russian firms in the trade finance market are, 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 as you know, SMEs, which commercial banks discourage from applying for, uh, for trade finance facilities, mainly uh, due to collateral, uh, and uh, if we are if we are talking also uh, about SMEs, what we are facing mainly uh, from from the uh, about startup business, for instance, uh, we are facing especially um, uh, I'm, I'm, I'm facing most of the time uh, when we are looking at SMEs, especially startup business, uh, young entrepreneurs, uh, young uh, uh, women, um, then that mostly. You know, uh, they don't have um, collateral in the startup, and then most of the time, commercial banks are discouraging them. But, but from where I came, uh, from the development bank, I would say the, uh, the, the Eastern and Southern African Trade and Development Bank is commercially oriented uh, uh, development bank, um, mainly because uh, we are, we are uh, our larger of around 70% of our portfolio is trade finance. And around 70% is uh, project and infrastructure finance. But when we call also project and infrastructure finance, always there is a component of trade finance. So we are facing most of the time in this startup business this kind of problem. So most firms uh, do not have alternative trade finance source after being rejected, what, um, what uh, my previous speaker was uh, uh, pointed out. So um, the trade finance application rejection rate always remains high. But overall, uh, firms cite bureaucracy and delays in approval, high interest 
and fees, inadequate collateral, and limited credit period as the critical challenge in managing trade finance transactions. So I think from the policymaker side, we have to really uh, uh, support, but, but we don't have to forget also one point mark here. Uh, where's the main problem also there? The foreign exchange, foreign exchange. We don't have the hard currency problem, especially if we look at where, where I'm really very uh, uh, intense, where, where I'm working in the Eastern African country side. If you look at, um, I would say even Tanzania, Kenya is much better, but when you go a little bit uh, higher uh, or, or up, uh, like Ethiopia, for instance, if you look at, it's uh, just because of, uh, you know, uh, population size and uh, uh, import-based country, um, they have a lack of foreign currency, shortage, there is, a, there, is, there is a reserve problem for currency. These are also mainly uh, which, which our African countries are uh, uh, facing. And then plus it comes also mainly this collateral uh, uh, problem because uh, SM especially, um, it's a small business and then the, uh, from the commercial bank side, courage and uh, the development bank, that's why we are there and we have to support but that you can't have also unlimited limits. You are tied up with this, uh, with uh, uh, the country limit and sometimes you can't go beyond. And we can see uh, um, uh, the discouragement uh, most of the time in this area. Um, yeah, let me, uh, let me stop here, thank you. Uh, thank you very much. Um, 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 I appreciate your perspective. Um, Lamin, um, up to you now um, on the supply side, what could be done in terms of, you know, um, uh, reduce the collateral requirement, maybe reduce cost. Uh, we heard a few leads. I'll, I'll summarize what I heard just before um, turning to the demand side, but uh, you know much about these things. No, thank you very much, Mark. Um, and thanks to the rest of the panelists for being here. It's, it's a pleasure really having you with us today on this very important um, topic of um, access to trade finance for, for firms. Um, in Africa. Um, Mark, uh, I, my colleague Makiko has already, you know, um, referred to quite a few of the points that uh, we would have mentioned. She spoke about digitalization, for example, which I think is it's, it's very important. We know historically, um, banks are really very paper-based when it comes to the trade, they are very intensive in that. And of course, changing systems to become more digital uh, has a lot of cost uh, associated with it. But, um, Eventually, um, we have to be there. I mean, because it's more secure, the turnaround time is shorter, and it will reduce cost. Um, you know, speaking about this, the study indicated that uh, in Kenya, the NPL for trade finance is eight percent amongst firms. And one of the reasons that they gave, you know, is because even the challenges that they have in terms of uh, the short grace period um, that they're given, it, it's a challenge. But more importantly, one of the challenges they face is that there's too much bureaucracy and the delay in processing their requests. So digitalization should really help, you know, um, you know, enhance basically the turnaround time and reduce the bureaucracy. So that would be very important um, in, in some of these markets. But when you look at the supply side of, of trade finance, as we're saying, there are different components to it. You can look at it from the banks themselves because the banks need to have the funding, right? Or the capacity for them to be able to supply the funds. So really, I mean, how they access financing from global banks, from DFIs like ourselves become key or the guarantees that we can provide them to enhance their capacity. So that could be one important angle to look at. So providing them with the lines of credit that we do, TDB ourselves, um, IFC and First Round Bank are all important, um, but also giving them the credit enhancement that they require. And most of us, that's what we do now. Our guarantee instruments support local banks so that international banks are more comfortable giving them funding. But that is just one part of the equation. The more important and critical part we're speaking about today is getting the funding to the, 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 the SMEs and the firms that need it, how the banks would create that supply. And I think this is where most of us really need to be a bit more. You know, provide sort of guarantees at the farm level, first loss guarantees, 
or in some instances, guarantees at the very back end of the transactions. Um, you know, I think that would be key. In Kenya, like I said again, the grace period is short. So how do we extend that for them? You know, so it means you have to elongate or lengthen the, 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 the tenure of the transaction itself. Perhaps we can cover that part of the, you know, of the transaction. I think that would be key. For the banks themselves, a few things that they need to do. I think most times the credit you know, scoring systems and models that they have you know, are not very appropriate for SMEs particularly. They're very well attuned to those of um, you know, the bigger corporates that they deal with. And I remember some years ago, a couple of DFIs you know, worked with banks in Mauritania and others to help them put in place credit scoring systems that are appropriate for the macroeconomy, for the market they're in, and for the different clients that they will work with. The previous studies also indicated that capacity, even in the local banks themselves, to roll out instruments that Marco spoke about, the supply chain finance and so on, would require that local banks, the staff there are well capacitized, that they understand these instruments, that the systems are there for them to really, you know, make them work uh, appropriately. So we, we should be working um, quite considerably with them to enhance their capacity. In terms of the alternative sources of financing beyond supply chain, we do have factoring as well. We've been working with um, Afri Exim Bank, supporting them, you know, with, with, a, with a trust fund, a grant to develop, you know, model laws to help countries in Africa, you know, improve their legal frameworks to make them up to date, more inclusive, you know, and more innovative so that it can handle, you know, where the market is really going. Because we know the market is usually two, three steps way ahead of, of the regulators and the, you know, the governments. So we really need to help the governments to, to come up the chain. We spoke about the fintechs in general, I mean, the marketplaces, the platforms that they have, and how they're now contributing to the supply of liquidity in the market, or just creating, you know, sort of awareness between the buyers or the demanders and the suppliers of financing. That is, is really key, that we enable them more and more working with banks. I know EcoBank has this um, fintech competition that they do you know, often and again, where they bring um, fintechs together to really make a pitch for, you know, basically how business can be done differently and how we can collaborate more. So indeed, there are lots to cover, Mark. Um, so not to repeat uh, what my colleague, Mark Ikwa, said, I think I've sort of complimented uh, in many ways um, on the supply side. So a lot to be done by DFIs, MDBs like ourselves, global banks, local banks, all together, you know, and, and, and the alternative providers of financing to, to increase the supply of uh, trade finance, you know, in Africa. Thank you very much, uh, Lamin. Uh, well, we heard a lot uh, of, of good leads uh, on that supply side discussion. Uh, I, I mean, I'll just, uh, I pick up what I've been uh, writing down as notes during the discussion. Uh, the, the need, how to reduce collateral requirements. Uh, digitization in, is obviously one important element to have the documents to know where um, who's controlling the merchandise at what time, and uh, that is key. I would even add uh, also enforcement of that is important because a lot of bankers, when I go in low-income countries, are telling me ICC uh, uh, rules are very nice, but uh, at the end of the day, you know, can I have control over the merchandise? Can I uh, seize it, uh, size it ex officio if there is a default? It is, it is a major issue. It's more of an LC issue, but developing also uh, uh, infrastructure like credit bureaus, um, alternative to um, trade finance, uh, reducing bureaucracy uh, delays in uh, indeed a 90 days uh, cycle, uh, which require um, a high responsiveness by the suppliers. Uh, need uh, banks need also to have support um, in terms of the financing and liquidity, uh, credit enhancement by uh, DFIs, um, getting funding uh, to SMEs uh, through, for example, providing the guarantee on the back of the transaction, uh, extending perhaps grace period so that the uh, default rate uh, falls um, that would then not feed more collateral requirements um, and um, uh, have to deal, um, uh, develop maybe credit scoring systems, uh, perhaps with fintechs to um, uh, reach out 
better with SME. So these are some of the leads and we will not solve the problem today, but at least the, the problem is well identified. And I'd like to uh, precisely move on demand. What needs to be done with respect, and we've heard already a few leads with respect to the demand side to the companies, um, we know that some of them do not have uh, a, a very good knowledge of uh, trade finance instrument, what to ask, what is uh, um, uh, related to their cash cycle, what is their understanding of the input that they need to produce the output, how to present right proper financial, how to pr even for alternative forms of finance like um, um, factoring, how to present recognizable invoice what, um, Makiko, starting with you, what would be your um, uh, wish list if uh, we were to, um, let's say, um, educate more the SMEs? Uh, what, what would come on the top of things for them to do to better ask for trade finance? Thank you, Mark. Um, I think this report uh, gave us a good opportunity to reconsider this issue because it's, it's more like a wake-up call for us because we we know that uh, SMEs have a difficult accessing trade finance but then actually this report is showing that uh, for example this is really a basics that uh, they have a fear to go back to the bank again and then if they are once rejected then it is difficult for them to go back it's going to be more like their trauma they cannot go back to the bank counter anymore this is a wake up call and then i think this reminds us uh, of uh, importance of uh, those education and then i think knowledge is a power that uh, i think um, we have to make sure that uh, we have a opportunity to provide the sufficient information to the banks so from that point of view i mean this country focus trade finance gap study is really effective i think and then uh, from that point of view, i would like to praise african development bank colleagues again because if you think about africa trade finance gap like 80 or 90 billion us dollars then yes, this is out there. But then if we focus on, for example, Tanzania, this is 1.3 billion. And then these are the issues that the SMEs are saying. Then I think it's easy for us to, to work which kind of component we should include in the SME workshop, for example. And then uh, Lamin's team, African Development Bank and IFC, we are trying to work together with WTO to implement SME workshop. And then, for example, this month, we have uh, one in Cote d'Ivoire. So this type of report uh, gives us a good, uh, more like a brainstorming session that what kind of needs, what kind of uh, component we should include in this uh, workshop so that uh, we can actually raise the awareness of uh, SMEs and then encourage SMEs to, to improve their ability to use the trade finance techniques, ability to, to go to the banks and apply uh, trade finance uh, with the proper documentation. I think those are really a basics that we are talking about. But then again, uh, we need to spend more time to educate SMEs, assist SMEs, uh, more like handholding SMEs to see how they can apply for those uh, uh, trade finance opportunities. Um, so I think that's to summarize one thing. Um, Again, it's uh, maybe a um, good reminder for us that uh, this type of SME workshop, SME education is uh, important. And then I think um, maybe we need uh, more like a, a industry collaboration in this case, where maybe an industry association, or maybe if the ministry has a SME promotion type of uh, uh, area, this is maybe a collaboration that we should seek um, so that uh, we can actually close the loop with all of those uh, stakeholders to see how we can assist SMEs, um, not just a, um, maybe a supply side, but then SME side too, they have to pick up those knowledge and they have to, to, to take actions to come to the banks. So I'm glad to hear from uh, uh, Suresh that uh, uh, Suresh was saying that uh, uh, he wants to support SMEs. So I think from the bank side, there is a willingness to support SMEs. From the SME side, they have to come to that level so I think we need an ecosystem collaborations where maybe a government side too, they have to think about uh, how they can assist those in this, uh, industry segment. So maybe industry association might need to step up. So I propose that maybe, uh, yes, demand side is important, SME has to learn, but then uh, more like a wider range of uh, all stakeholders, ecosystem collaboration is needed here. 
Thank you. Thank you, Makiko. And indeed, uh, during the uh, Côte d'Ivoire uh, workshop that is coming up in a couple of weeks, we will have uh, the specialists from African Development Bank and Africa Bank with us um, to speak to SMEs, but also to the banks. And we will have them in the same seminar. They may not have this necessarily the same level of knowledge, but we will have them discuss with one another some of the issues we are precisely discussing now. Uh, but uh, Suresh, you, you have the floor now to be followed by uh, SAS and, uh, and Lamin. Thank you, Dr. Mark. I, I think, I think Makiko, I, I fully agree with you. I think as an industry, um, we, we need to start with the base education. Um, because I, I think, you know, when we're looking at SMEs, whether it's trade finance or working capital, I think we face the same the same challenges. Uh, remember that trade finance is marked against the same working capital uh, line uh, with you know within the bank itself. So 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 where you know that LC is, is against that working capital line. So it's more around how do we educate SMEs as to when is there a need to to import substitute, for example? When is there a need for them to perhaps uh, look at LCs? Are there alternative instruments that they should be using in discussing? With uh, uh, you know, with their respective importers or their exporters, and I think banks, to be to be quite honest, hasn't spent a lot of time investing in the education part of of SMEs in order to enhance their knowledge, so that when they come to the bank, they are armed with the knowledge and understand what they want. Too frequently, I believe um, that that because of this lack of understanding, banks misunderstand the requirements. And either misdiagnose the financial requirements, or alternatively, say go back and 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 come back once you have the information, which could be then perhaps constitute a rejection uh, as as part of the service. I think that's important. The second part, Lamine focused on was, and I think it's really important, is that we're going to need to, in order to achieve velocity on the demand side, is take a portfolio approach. I've been a big advocate of taking a portfolio approach. Um, I love the fact that we can look at a first loss type of, of program or reverse first loss programs that will really help commercial banks to accelerate the, the demand side of SMEs, make a deliberate attempt to start to look and focus on the SME business. Because remember, it is costing a considerable amount to risk manage, document check, and, and, and look at the entire value chain of the cycle especially when the amounts are smaller the, and, and the costs remain the same, your cost to income ratio obviously goes through, which makes it a little bit more unprofitable for banks to be in this particular segment, particularly in trade finance. So for me, there are three components. Bob. One, education. Secondly, some of the risk mitigation tools. I mean, we've already got the architect chain working with the IFC, with the AFDB, on, on, on RPA programs, the GTFP is a sterling example, and AFDB's RPA programs. I think what we need to do is take the technology of these programs and bring them somehow into a very, very strong SME program, uh, you know, with some mitigants that banks can actually look to accelerate into, in, into Africa. The last thing I just wanted to mention was that when we're looking at capacity, uh, and, 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 and the education would be really, really great for us to follow this up with a couple of good case studies of, of a few hundred maybe SMEs and their experiences. And there is so much rich learning that could come out of there that we can actually take it and apply to a fully fledged program that we can apply to, you know, across the, 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 the African continent per se. I'll stop there. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Suresh. And uh, to be followed by SAS, please, your perspective. Uh, thank you, Mike. Um, I think uh, Suresh and Mike, uh, they put it very, very well. Uh, uh, I think I, I, can, I can only say from, from my experience, uh, uh, in addition to what, what uh, my previous speaker said. Um, you know, it's, uh, uh, Mike, I think, uh, uh, you know, by 2040, uh, half of the world is used will be in Africa. So the Africans will be half of uh, uh, the world use, use population, so young population. So what we are doing is, I mean, especially in the SME side and then the, 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 the startup business and so on, if we are not focusing and then the policymakers, if we are not really looking at that, uh, that area, then, then uh, 
really we will have a problem. I think this um, uh, this young population, uh, um, because the importation of I mean uh, storage, for instance, we touched some some points. Um, uh, you know, working capital. If you don't give them a working capital, because most of most of the problem what we are looking is uh, in some banks, especially the commercial banks, that the working capital they don't look it as a trade finance. But you know, uh, you have to give, you have to provide working capital for for this uh, uh, SME uh, area uh, because uh, they need, for instance, uh, uh, importation of machinery uh, for for their business. Then after, then uh, for for let's say if you are taking someone for imported, I mean, my recent uh, example, for instance, someone. Uh, he he uh, introduces the biofuel uh, production and then he, he he wants to have it from Europe um, uh, 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 a machine a machinery so uh, he couldn't get it that credit and uh, he he already got the land and then everything but but uh, he he doesn't have the machine so uh, we are trying to help him under our SME uh, uh, program. Uh, we gave him as a working capital for, for a sub six months uh, uh, rest period. And plus, uh, one point we don't have to forget, you know, uh, a default scenario. We, as, as a development fund, as a DFI, we don't really like this word default, but mostly you have to prepare a refinancing package when you are uh, providing them. So uh, by, by saying refinancing, um, let's say after that six months, uh, uh, the, the, this uh, uh, client has a problem, couldn't pay, then he, he can call the refinancing uh, package at the six months, at the end of at, at maturity, he can call it the refinancing package and he can use it that refinancing um, uh, 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 as, as a refinancing or, 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 or supporting his business. And uh, on, on the other side also, um, I mean, uh, Lamin was touched also. Uh, he said, "You know, you have to you have to prepare the unfunded uh, trade finance method." You know, we, with African Development Bank, we had we have a huge uh, MRPA program, market uh, the master risk participation agreement. So uh, you have to uh, by taking risk and uh, indirectly giving a guarantee. Uh, when you have a limit issue, then then you can support uh, this, this SMEs uh, taking as a because for instance FDB African Development Bank and IFC as an example uh, or or wallet bank as a policy maker bank uh, especially uh, wallet bank and African Development Bank then uh, they can provide you a guarantee uh, that is the unfunded trade finance facility. Then, then you can support them by financing because it's it's it's, uh, it's uh, um, somehow uh, uh, covered. And one point, uh, last point is I'm, I mean I mean education is very important. What my uh, my uh, my uh, said and then also spiritual uh, But uh, for instance, uh, from uh, my experience, uh, we are for instance supporting in in our region. Uh, it's called um, Mother's Bank. That is focus on, on women, uh, uh, entrepreneurs, women startup business, a young girl. Um, there was, there was uh, a lady, uh, again, what she had a problem. She uh, uh, invented, she was uh, working as an as intern, uh, internship uh, in the UNICEF. Then she learned from there with, uh, with the plastic bricks. Um, they are doing schools and they are, they are uh, building a school. And uh, now she she brought it that idea and uh, from uh, from the waste plastic uh, doing uh, a plastic brick. And uh, again, that uh, that young girl she had uh, a huge problem for financing again working capital. So um, unless if you see such kind of really uh, businesses, they will have of course a problem because it's a startup business, and uh, of course it is also one of the trade finance. But you have to be innovative. And giving them a working capital on the one side. On the other side, you have to uh, uh, put um, a safety net. I would what I said it as a, a refinancing package in case of in case of uh, uh, 
payment at maturity payment problem or what what was uh, mostly saying before then they can call the refinance package uh, they can extend also uh, as a rollover method uh, rollover uh, financing the, their business so thank we you, have to we have to focus on that and then let me stop here okay thank you thank you very much isaias um lamin we we're running a bit of uh, out of time we have five minutes before the end of the program so you'll have probably the last word on uh, on demand and uh, i don't need fr frankly to conclude it's been a very rich discussion uh, no need to conclude other than actually to um to encourage people to actually read the report uh, which will be out but uh lamin you you have the last word on um on demand no, well, the moderator is the chair, and the chair always have the last word, Mark. Okay, so, I'll have a, <laughs> so a last word. I, so I, I'll make it very short and not repeat what my colleagues said, because the denom common denominator has been capacity building, um, increasing awareness for SMEs in terms of product knowledge, but also, you know, to understand the requirements of banks. You know, as Nick Shura has mentioned that, you, when you go to the bank, your file needs to be complete. Otherwise, you get rejected. You will feel discouraged. You will not go back. And the study has indicated that has been, you know, a, a major stumbling block to access to finance. But I just want to focus on two things. And one is, we, we know, um, and many of us hear this often, that uh, the firms tend to have two sets of accounts, right? One for the auditors and the other for their bankers. Um, you know, often which means the accounts are not really complete. I think firms themselves need to do more to have robust, credible you know, financial statements that banks can rely on. I think that will make a, a big difference in terms of their assessment. One point that we've not emphasized much on, and which has come out in study after study, is that in addition to the weak credit worthiness or inadequate collateral are the KYC requirements. Banks, you know, of course, now with all the sanctions that apply, are really scared to do you know, to even basically extend any financing to a, a firm you know, that doesn't meet the basic KYC requirements. So firms themselves need to do a lot more in terms of the information they put together, be it on their websites or their financial statements to ensure that they're credible, that they're available, they are visible, and they can be relied upon. I think that is gonna be very key. I mean, in addition to this is the legal entity identifier that's now coming up as, you know, as one of the, you know, <clears throat> services that can be used to be able to quickly identify whichever corporate and wherever you are in the world and that you have a number that is really very unique to you. I think that is key. And finally, before I hand over to you, Mark, is a point that you sort of alluded to. It's collateral enforcement. You know, we're having the legal systems that are able to really quickly enforce, you know, basically foreclosures. I think banks, tend to fear, not only do they fear NPLs, because if they are high, they fail to lend, but if they're not able to foreclose on the secrets that they have for either for legal reasons in terms of interpretation, you talk about um, ICC rules, but also just because the local courts are just too slow or not properly you know, capacitated to deal with this, that becomes a problem. So setting up commercial courts, for example, that will deal specifically you know, with issues of this nature would be key. Uh, Mark, I will hand over to you. I know this has been a very interesting conversation. There are a lot more to say, but uh, in the interest of time, back to you for your wrap up. Yes, we could go on for a little while. As a specialist, of course, we are passionate about our subject. We, I heard on the second part of the discussion, education, the quality of project, helping accompanying uh, the smaller firm, the young ones. Uh, improving the KYC requirements, uh, improving the quality of documentation, financials, and, and enforcement issues, KYC issues, I mean, making yourself known and uh, having, um, having an uh, identifiable uh, um, identity um, to start with when you have a project. So um, we, I, I would strongly recommend that uh, this report be read. It is um, a landmark report and I think um, um, more report, more deep dive will be done. Hopefully um, perhaps institutions join forces to do so. 
uh, we're thinking about it, IFC, IFDB, um, WTO, like in the capacity building uh, side, uh, we've been strong at, at teaming up at developing the trade finance facilitation program over the past um, decade. I think we can go a bit deeper than that in terms of the information on markets, that is the, the report and the analysis, and in doing capacity building, this is what we all have in mind as a um, public institution uh, uh, with the private sector, to work with the private sector to improve, to reduce, the, as we say as economists, the asymmetries of information um, and, and improve the, the uh, quality and the infrastructure in the market so as to reduce cost and improve the availability. That is my last word as a chair, as you said, Lamin. And uh, with this, I um, say bravo again to the AFDB and thank you very much for everyone's attendance today. It's been a well attended, about 140 participants, and I I, I, I regret very much not to have been able to um, address uh, the couple of questions that were asked, but uh, hopefully maybe the authors will uh, reach out directly to those who have asked the questions. So thank you and goodbye for today. Thank you. Goodbye. Thank you. Thank you, goodbye. Goodbye.